students this is dr sangram patel again we are starting part 2 of the chapter 1 science technology standard 10 state board syllabus heredity and evolution if you haven't gone through part 1 please access it on youtube channel so let us move on to the remaining part of this chapter here we are going to look at various evidences for evolution the collective thinking upon all the above mentioned theories implies that evolution is everlasting process of changes however it needs proof to prove it following are the proofs available the first is morphological evidences now they've asked us to observe the images and note the similarities between these animal images and the plant images so there are three animal photos and quite similar animals if you look at their jaw their nose eyes ears the shape of the head is quite similar and look at the plants the leaves the shape of the fruit the shape of the leaves it's quite similar to each other the similarities uh, in structure of mouth position of eyes structure of nostrils ear pinny and thickly distributed hair on body in these animals and again in the plants the characters like leaf shape leaf venation leaf uh, patiole etc occur in case of plants and this indicates that there are some similarities in these groups let us move on to the second type of evidence which is anatomical evidence if we observe the neighboring pictures there doesn't seem any superficial similarity between the hand of a man and four leg of ox flipper of whale and patagium of bat have a look at them similarly use of each of these structures is different in all these animals however there is similarity in the structure of bones and joints in organs of each of these animals if you look carefully the number of bones and the joints and their relation to each other is similar this similarity indicates that these animals may have common ancestors now there are questions here which are different organs in body of organisms second question is each of the organs useful to organism now this is quite vague and general question which are different organs so you can mention all the organs from brain to the uh, digestive system reproductive system and lungs and heart cardiovascular system respiratory system uh, is each of the organ useful most of them are useful some organs are not useful we have seen it earlier in part one of this chapter that appendix some people think that appendix is not useful organ uh, third molar tooth which is also known as wisdom tooth is not useful organ so that's anatomical evidence comes from vestigial organs degenerated or underdeveloped useless organs of organisms are called as vestigial organs in living organisms sudden development of new tissues or organs for living in changing environment is not possible instead existing organs undergo gradual changes mostly a specific structure in the body is useful under certain situation however same structure under different situation may not be 
useful or it may even be harmful. Such structure begins to degenerate under these circumstances. As per the principle of natural selection, it takes thousands of years for a structure to disappear. Such organs are seen in different phases of disappearance in different animals. Such organs, though non-functional in certain organisms, they may be functional in other organisms. That is, it is not vestigial in other animals. Appendix, which is useless to human, is useful and fully functional in ruminants. Similarly, muscles of ear pinna, which are not useful to us, are useful in monkeys and they use to move the pinna, ear pinna. Various vestigial organs like tailbone, which is called coccyx, wisdom tooth, body hair are present in the body of human being but their use is not relevant they are not useful for us have a look at these diagrams there's a ear muscles in human being wisdom teeth that is third molar teeth coccyx bone which is at the end of the spine and appendix the next evidence comes from paleontological examples have a look at these diagrams so you can maximize this video or maximize this window and have a look at these fossils. A question may arise in your mind which organisms existed millions of years ago and how do we know about them? Now this secret has been hidden in the layers of the earth large number of organisms get buried due to flood, earthquake or volcanoes. And remnants and impressions of these organisms remain preserved in the earth layers. These are called as fossils. Study of fossils is an important part of evolution study. Let's look into details of this. Carbon consumption of animals and plants stops after they die. And only the decaying process of carbon-14 occurs continuously after the death of animal and plant. In case of dead bodies, instead of, instead of remaining constant, the ratio of carbon-14 and carbon-12 changes continuously as carbon-12 is non-radioactive and carbon-14 is radioactive. As the time passes after death of plant or animal, the time since the death can be calculated by measuring radioactivity of carbon-14 and ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12 present in the body at present moment. This is called carbon dating method. It is used in paleontology and anthropology to estimate the age of fossils and manuscripts. Once the age is determined, it's easy to find out the information about other organisms. It looks like vertebrates have been slowly originated from invertebrates. Now let's have a look at this diagram. Structure of ground level and fossils. So there are different eras Paleozoic era, Mesozoic era, Cenozoic era. So these animals got stuck in the layers of the earth during different time periods. 
different eras and depending on their time different animals were found in those layers such as invertebrates are the oldest animals then came amphibians then reptiles and mammals and birds came last in the process of evolution let's study a little bit about the scientist in relation to carbon dating this method is based on the radioactive decay of carbon 14 and this was developed by Willard Libby and he received Nobel Prize in 1960 for this invention. The age of the materials determined by this method are published in the journal Radiocarbon. So very important discovery in evolution. The next evidence is connecting links. Now have a look at these pictures and see what you think of the characters observed in these pictures. Duckbill platypus, lungfish and peripatus. These are few animals with special characteristics. Let's go into details of these. Now some plants and animals have morphological features in such a way that they can be related to two different groups. Hence they are called as connecting links. Example, peripatous characters like segmented body, thin cuticle and parapodia like organs are present. Similarly, these animals show tracheal respiration and open circulatory system similar to arthropods. This indicates that peripatus is connecting link between annelida and arthropoda. Similarly, duck-billed platypus lays eggs like reptiles but also shows relationship with mammals due to presence of mammary glands and hair. Lungfish performs respiration with lungs irrespective of being a fish. This is very interesting. It's a fish but it breathes with the help of lungs. These examples indicate that mammals are evolved from reptiles and amphibians from fishes. The next evidence in evolution comes from embryological studies. Have a look at these embryos. These are embryos of different organisms. The one on left side are fish embryos and then salamander, tortoise, chicken, pig, cow, rabbit and human embryo is the rightmost and first second third are the stages of development the first is the youngest the earliest form the second is the middle form and third is the developed form of embryo now what does embryological evidence suggest comparative study of embryonic developmental stages of various vertebrates given in the pictures show that all embryos show extreme similarities during initial stages and those similarities decrease gradually as the embryos develop as they grow so if you look at stage one they all look similar stage two in the diagram it's quite different but still there are similarities and stage 3 is completely different from each other. Similarities in initial stages indicate the common origin of all these animals.
so that's embryological evidence for evolution the next in line is darwin's theory of natural selection charles darwin had collected innumerable specimens of plants and animals and depending upon the observations of those specimens he published a theory of natural selection which preaches the survival of the fittest for this purpose darwin had published a book called origin of species while explaining this concept he says that all the organisms reproduce prolifically all the organisms compete with each other in life threatening manner in this competition only those organisms sustain which show the modifications essential for winning the competition so the animals organisms which are fittest for survival they will succeed in this competition however besides this natural selection also plays an important role because nature selects only those organisms which are fit to live and the rest organisms they die they perish sustaining and selected organisms can perform reproduction and thereby give rise to new species with their own specific characters darwin's theory of natural selection was widely accepted for a long duration however there are some objections the main objections are first natural selection is not the only factor responsible for evolution second darwin did not mention any explanation about useful and useless modifications third there is no explanation about slow changes and abrupt changes in his book origin of species irrespective of all these objections darwin's work of evolution is an important milestone in the study of evolution few points about charles robert darwin he was born in 1809 and he died in 1882 he was english biologist and he proposed theory of evolution that is natural selection he showed that all the species of living organism have been gradually evolved over a period of thousands of years from common ancestor he proposed that principle of natural selection is responsible for this evolution now next important and interesting theory about evolution is lamarckism jean baptiste lamarck proposed that morphological changes occurring in living organisms are responsible for evolution and the reason behind these morphological changes is activities or laziness of that organism and he called this concept as principle of use or disuse of organs so if the organisms are active they are using the organ and that will be transmitted if they are lazy they are disusing the organ so these organs and this type of organisms they will not be able to reproduce and they will vanish further he said that the neck of giraffe has become too long due to browsing on leaves on tall plants by extending their neck for several generations similarly shoulders of the iron smith have become very strong due to frequent hammering movements wings of birds like ostrich and emu have become weak due to disuse because they haven't used them legs of birds like swan and duck have become useful for swimming due to living in water and snakes have lost their legs by modifications in their body for burrowing habits all these examples are types of acquired characters and are transferred from one generation to the next this is called theory of inheritance of acquired characters or lamarckism 
development of organs due to specific activities or their degeneration due to no use at all was widely accepted but transfer of those characters from one generation to the next was rejected because it had been verified many times that modifications brought in us are not transferred to next generation and thereby Lamarck's theory was disproved. The living organisms can transfer the characters which it has acquired to the next generation. This is called ancestry of acquired characters. Few points about Lamarck. His full name was Jean Baptiste Lamarck. Was born in 1744 and he died in 1829. He proposed the activities of the organisms are responsible for their evolution. He was French. He was naturalist and he also proposed that each animal or a plant undergoes some changes in its lifespan and those changes are transferred to the next generation and such changes occur in next subsequent generation too. The next important point is speciation. Formation of new species of plants and animals is the effect of evolution process. Species is the group of organisms that can produce fertile individuals through natural reproduction. I'm reading it again. Species is the group of organisms that can produce fertile individuals through natural reproduction. Each species grows in specific geographical situation. Their food, habitat, reproductive ability and period is different. However, Genetic variation is responsible for formation of new species from the earlier one. Besides, geographical and reproductive changes are also responsible for formation of new species. Similarly, geographical or reproductive isolation also leads to speciation. Now let's turn to human evolution. The biodiversity that is known today has been said to be formed from very simple single cell organism due to evolution. In this evolution, origin of human can be shown as per the picture given in next slide. The last dinosaurs disappeared approximately 70 million years ago, that is 7 crore, 70 million years. At that time, monkey-like animals are said to be evolved from some ancestors who were more or less similar to modern lemurs. Tail of these monkey-like animals of Africa is said to have disappeared about 40 million years ago that is 4 crore 40 million years ago the tail disappeared they developed due to enlargement in brain their hands were also improved and thus ape-like animals were evolved meanwhile these ape-like animals reached south and northeast asia and finally evolved into gibbon and orang utan those apes started to live on land as the forests started to decline due to dry weather. Their lumber bones developed in such a way that they started to stand in erect posture, that is standing posture, in grasslands and thereby their hands became available to use anytime. These first human-like animals with standing posture that is erect posture were using their hands have evolved about 20 million years ago that is two crore years 20 million first record of human-like animal is with us in the form of ramapithecus ape from east africa after that 
this ape grown up in size and became more intelligent and thus the ape of South Africa evolved about 4 million years ago that is 40 lakh years 4 million years the morphology of these human-like animals started to appear like to be the member of genius homo and that was about 2 million years ago thus skilled human were developed about 1.5 million years ago human walking with erect posture was evolved it may have existed in china and Indo indonesia of asian continent evolution of upright human continued in the direction of developing its brain for a period of about 100,000 years that is 1 lakh years and meanwhile it discovered the fire brain of 50,000 year old man had been sufficiently evolved to the extent that it could be considered as member of class wise man homo sapiens so that was the origin of homo sapiens and we are homo sapiens neanderthal man can be considered as the first example of wise man you can see the photo of neanderthal man here in this slide the crow Magnan man evolved about 50,000 years ago and afterwards this evolution had been faster than the earlier speed of evolution. About 10,000 years ago wise man started to practice the agriculture. It started to rear the cattle herds and established the cities. Cultural development took place. Art of writing was invented about 5,000 years ago. And thus the history has been started. Modern science emerged about 400 years ago. And industrial society was established about 200 years ago. Now we have reached at this stage and still we are looking back into the history to look for roots of human ancestry. So this is the end of part two and end of the chap first chapter that is evolution and heredity. The second chapter we will be taking in a separate video and you can access it on YouTube channel. The chapter name is Life Processes in Living Organisms. Hope you enjoyed uh, this chapter and keep accessing YouTube channel for more such information and knowledge resources. Thanks. Take care. Bye.